Facing the Light is a show of about 130 portraits of people who are involved in one way or another with the Parkinson's uh, story. Um, and the idea behind the show is to uh, portray these people in the light that is effectively starting to, to shine on the field of Parkinson's uh, and its, its research, the medicine, the cure, and the people that will receive that cure. The exhibition is at the OXO Tower Gallery, um, which is uh, in, the Oxo, in the ground floor of the OXO Tower, right on the River Thames. Uh, lovely location, and uh, it's got lovely light. It's got lovely glass walls, and it's a beautiful gallery. I'm painting people with Parkinson's, um, people in their families and their close friends that um, uh, have to accommodate the changes in their lives. Uh, I'm painting uh, activists who are raising money um, for charities, medics and researchers who are putting uh, effort into creating cures and moving those cures from the labs into market trials. Uh, but I'm also painting a, an interesting group of um, supporters who are in business, the arts, um, in music, in acting, and uh, in sport. And so there's quite a wide diversity of people involved in the show, but they all, in one way or another, have something to do with um, the Parkinson story and the special moment that is now. So at the moment, um, Parkinson's is moving from uh, an unknown, terrible, degenerative disease with no cure. And it's been like that for a century. Um, and over the last 10 years, it's been moving slowly um, from uh, nowhere to somewhere in terms of uh, understanding of the cause or at least understanding of um, what the kinds of uh, treatments are that could reverse Parkinson's and right now it's a very special moment because some of those cures um, cures with quotes they're not they're not out in the marketplace yet but they are real medical fixes which actually reverse the conditions of Parkinson's um, not just to treat the symptoms but actually reverse the condition so in the labs those are working um, and they're moving to field trials and the next few years we should see uh, some kind of improvement and change in the marketplace. Two reasons really, I mean I have um, some friends who have Parkinson's and at a personal level I want to just help them. But also um, there is something very interesting about the emergence of something new in the field of human knowledge, medicine and science. And, uh, and I can't deny that that does also drive my interest. So it's a sort of combination of, of those two things really, which is propelling me to um, embrace the people that are involved in the Parkinson's story. Um, the, show, the show's been a year really in the making and um, in March 2012 I I started I called Sting um, someone gave me Sting's phone number and I'd never rung Sting before <laughs> and, and he said uh, no <laughs> um, but I was pretty determined I wanted to try and get a group of uh, well-known figures to uh, support the particular charity that we're um, we're funding with this show which is Cure Parkinson's Trust and uh, ever since I got that no from Sting, and, and Sting, if you're out there right now, <laughs> see what you missed. Um, ever since uh, he said no, I, I've basically uh, recruited loads and loads of amazing people who've been really willing, really helpful to, uh, to get involved. It's been a fantastic roller coaster ride meeting uh, elderly people with Parkinson's, very young people with Parkinson's. Uh, some of the great brains and, and minds in this country, the UK has probably the world's leading uh, medics and uh, researchers. And, and so over the course of um, the summer of 2012 and into, um, into the autumn, um, that's when the show really started to come together, people um, putting their names forward and their, um, and their stories uh, forward to the show. And, um, 
and then gradually uh, over a sort of week by week basis we just amass more and more sitters uh, and uh, as we talk at the moment I think we're up at about 109 sitters and it looks like we should wind up with about 130 uh, when the show's over. The final show is on the 10th of April at the uh, Oxo Tower in, in London and um, it will continue to live after. The shows last for a week in that gallery, but um, there's a very big online um, website with uh, all the pictures there, and there are uh, videos and, and so on. So it's, it, although the, the show has a life in the real world in April, which coincides with World Parkinson's Day and, and Parkinson's Awareness Week, um, the show will be up really online for the whole of 2013. Number one, I'm trying to get some consistency so that the works all look like they belong together. Uh, it's a show, after all. Um, I'm, but I'm also trying to uh, make things as diverse as I can within those limitations. And uh, so you'll see there are quite a few different approaches to uh, painting. I mean, there are oils, there are acrylics, there are very watery looking uh, works. Um, and I suppose on... Uh, Around all that, what I'm trying to do, well, I suppose at the heart of each portrait, I'm trying to portray not just what I see when I meet a sitter, but I'm trying to get something of their personality and their character into the work, but within the context of the ever-present light, which is the theme of the show. And so um, light is a kind of an unseen character skipping its way through the various portraits that I'm doing, and I'm kind of conscious the whole time of trying to let that playfulness, the light playfulness, have a role within each, within each painting. Well, it's been, it's been, it's been quite a challenge. Um, it's not easy uh, doing 130 portraits quickly. Um, it's, it's pretty demanding work and uh, some sitters naturally just they're easy to paint for, for one reason or another there's just something about their personality or their face um, which just comes to life when you start painting um, so it's going as well as I can I can make it go but it, it is it, it's it's pretty stretching visually what inspires me um, uh, is, is a mixture of um, various movements of art um, vorticism, impressionism and expressionism are my, I suppose my three main um, uh, schools of influence if you like but film is also a very big one and, and you know we all have such a a phenomenal knowledge and experience of the visual language of film even if we don't know it we we see so many films on TV and, and in the cinema and that visual language um, is uh, you know things like whether the cameras slightly to the left of the character or um, above the character or below the character those sorts of very subtle adjustments mean an awful lot to our eyes and uh, so I I have tried to borrow a little bit from um, film technique um, it, just as a kind of source of inspiration for approaching each painting. So I paint with this. Um, this is a, an electronic brush. And I, I paint on a, on a tablet, but although it looks like a pen, um, on screen it behaves just like a brush so you can stipple with it you can streak you can flood an area by using very um, watery and wet um, paint behaviors on screen um, and so I paint very much like uh, an acrylic or oil painter would paint using physical paints um, but with the computer you can um, you can do a lot more. You can, for instance, you can flood an area and then decide, well, you want to flood it more. And um, so you can just increase the flood effect. 
you can increase the bleed or reduce the bleed. So once you've done a flooding, I think, well, I might want to just pull that back. And you can pull it back with a, with a, a, a brush and a computer um, in a way that you can't with um, physical paints. Um, but I do, I paint in layers. So I tend to, I will put a very, uh, usually a fairly watery um, or thin uh, series of layers down first as a kind of glaze. Um, I usually have a few guidelines that I, I put in and I have a number of odd brushes that have odd behaviors um, on the computer so that they, for instance, you paint a line, it can change color or it can change thickness as you're painting. So it's, it's, um, it's not just due to pressure, it might be a slightly randomized line. And um, so you get quite interesting um, provocative effects, even just laying some of the guidelines down. Then I'll put a flood on top and then from there I'll start to build up you know, structure and, and detail and, you know, finally winding up with, um, you know, the very f f the finer parts of detail around the eyes and, and the lips. Um, all the software that you use in digital art is almost identical. It's very analogous to um, physical painting. So you do paint on something. Um, and in the real world, obviously, you start with card or paper or canvas. Um, with uh, the computer, you can start with a photograph. So you can start with a photograph of canvas if you want. You can start with a photograph of, um, well, anything you really want. I like to work with, um, not always, but uh, um, a lot of the time I like to work with local material. So I take a photograph of concrete or stone um, or something that's quite finely textured, which is near the location of the sitting. So it might be from outside someone's house or outside uh, the studio where I um, was, uh, which I, I use in London, which is in Covent Garden. Um, and that'll be my starting point um, before I uh, paint anything at all. That's the that's the canvas effectively. And then when I paint the lines on top of that, um, it just is literally applying paint to that surface. But with software, you can. Um, you can take that photograph and you can make it 3D so that the light points are the peaks and the dark points are the troughs so they'll catch paint more um, and, the, and the, the paint will pool in those little dark spots. So you can, you're effectively kind of getting a 3D painting effect. Um, I don't do it at all to all paintings and especially when you flood an area you, that tends to disappear a bit but um, it's just a nice way to start a painting. It's pretty simple symbolism, really. The light is, is about the emergence of cures. And um, uh, cures are moving from labs into clinical trials. And so there's two aspects of that which are very interesting. One is the arrival of knowledge, and the other is the arrival of hope in the form of clinical trials. And really, it, it is like, I mean, if you talk to people with Parkinson's and, and the people who are involved in these trials or the researchers, you know, there really is a, a lighter tone in their uh, voice. Um, it's not such a dark, um, terrible, horrific disease um, as they start to try um, these uh, medicines out. And so it just seemed to me natural that a visual metaphor for that is, uh, is, is light. And, and actually, it's the combination of light and dark. So we're, as we're moving from uh, a period of not really knowing what the disease is to uh, not certainty, but knowledge and um, efficacy in, in cures, um, the light and the dark together uh, just seem to me to put the, the, the Parkinson's special moment into one combined metaphor. Well, I, I actually use both. I mean, I do paint with um, acrylic paint. Um, I like acrylics because they, they dry fast. I'm a very impatient painter. <laughs> um, so acrylics are a great medium to work with. Um, and some of my works have, um, I will start with acrylics, uh, physical acrylics, um, get a basis of a painting going, and then take a photograph of that, bring that into the computer, and then continue to paint digitally on top. Uh, why on earth would I do that? It's because 
Um, although I love liquid paint and moving palette knives and brushes around uh, on physical surfaces, the power of what you can do with a computer is bigger. And uh, when I started painting, the undo button was the <laughs> was was the great appeal, so that you could you know you could try ten different things and undo 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 until you decided that you know you've got something that looks right. But I I don't use the undo button. Uh, I haven't really used it much at all. Um, really, what the computer gives you is impossible paints. It gives you paints which uh, invert the colors underneath, for instance. It gives you paints which amplify the chroma of the colors underneath or amplify the luminance of the colors underneath while holding the chroma level. Um, so there are all sorts of paints that you have in a computer that you don't have in the real world. They just offer you more possibilities and um, you very quickly learn that vocabulary. So you you just work with a larger vocabulary, really, and that's that's why I work with um, with digital digital paint. When I started, I was very interested in establishing the power of the light, um, and as as the show has evolved and we've gone through one hundred sitters now, um, I kind of go through phases of being interested in someone's face more, um, bone structure, um, or uh, sort of returning back to the light and letting the light do the talking. Um, and, or rather, by which I mean, you know, the light featuring more in the painting. So um, with some, some well-known sitters, that's Fred Macaulay behind me, for instance, the comedian, Scottish comedian, um, some sitters are more playful, and some, and especially some of the more well-known uh, figures, it's easier to go off piste a little bit and um, produce um, a work which perhaps just bends, uh, you know, in a direction of motion. I mean, with Fred Macaulay, for instance, we um, uh, Fred moved around quite a bit, and we got him to when he was. He wasn't sitting, he was standing. <laughs> we got him to sway in a circular motion and uh, we, got, we captured that on the camera. Um, lots and lots, I mean, I usually take about 100, 150 shots. And then I'll pick about five or six and, and form a little cluster, stick that up on the wall here and then uh, literally paint from that. And uh, in Fred's case, you know, we, I got loads of shots of this this head moving around and sometimes it was in profile sometimes it was straight on you know and um, uh, producing that painting was it's quite interesting trying to paint motion which is of course what the vorticists did and uh, um, perhaps in a more simplified way than I'm doing now but I'm trying to keep it within the context obviously of um, of the light and, and and the show which is you know themed around faces and light Well, um, every sitter is, of course, different and uh, brings a certain challenge to, to each painting. Um, having said that, there, yes, there are certainly sitters who are more playful or have been more um, uh, entertaining, perhaps, when we've uh, sat with them, um, certain cabinet ministers. Um, have certainly um, told us one or two stories which might have uh, brought a tear to the eye. Um, uh, but I suppose the most interesting ones for me are sitters who are willing to try different poses, gestures, facial expressions, or work with movement. Uh, and I'm quite, I am quite interested in movement. I don't want to do every single painting this way, but um, people like um, Julie Walters, Peter Capaldi, um, both of whom participated in uh, movement type portraits. So we wanted them to be together, I suppose, the sitter and I wanted them to be to be something 
but it was always themselves um, in in some kind of way. It's all very vague, but uh, it is vague at, a, at the early stages of a sitting. You don't quite know what you're doing until you, you until you see it. Um, some cabinet ministers were uh, not as serious in in their approach to oppose as you might expect. Uh, Ken Clark, um, for instance, was in particular was. Um, very relaxed in front of the camera and really wanted to pose himself in a way that represented the way that he is. Um, so yes, I mean, I, I, there are some pretty remarkable sitters, but I don't think any of them are better or worse than any of the other sitters. Well, I'm a figurative painter and a, a portrait painter, and I, I suppose I could have taken a figurative approach, um, but the story of Parkinson's um, was very much one that I wanted to make personal. And the easiest way of doing that is, is of course, with the face. So portraiture just seemed natural. Anyway, I've, I've worked with lights, uh, a strong emphasis on light and, uh, lights and, and quite dramatic lighting, um, which I enjoy. Um, so strong contrast between perhaps one side of the face and the other. Uh, maybe strong down lighting. Um, I've stayed away from under lighting um, because of its horror implications. <laughs> but um, I, uh, I, you know, we've used quite a lot of. Um, I've assistants who hold a variety of small lights quite near the face, and we illuminate different sorts of parts of the of the head, a temple, the edge of a nose, the back of an ear. Um, just to get a little bit of rim light or something to to uh, lift the um, the, uh, the sort of the shape or structure of um, of the head or face, and that's been great fun. I mean, I, normally I you know painters don't don't get this filmic, I suppose, with lighting, and I've really enjoyed that. Um, it's it's very um, it's. When, when I started, I didn't really know what I was doing, actually. I mean, we're just sort of mucking around with lights. And I think I've got a, a, quite a lot more knowledgeable about what I want to try and pull off. Um, but so e each sitting is, is, um, is a combination of a lighting setup, the character and personality of that um, sitter, and the, um, the playfulness with which they're willing to participate. Um, so whether we're doing motions or motion gestures um, or whether we've got you know I mean some people with Parkinson's shake quite a lot so for them actually standing still is quite uh, quite a challenge um, but I generally try and take you know 15 to 20 minutes um, for each for each sitting and to try and get the very best out of that that person's um, personality their um, their, perhaps their public profile, or something about their character or their um, in, their intent when they arrive, and bring that into the painting. When I come back to the studio from the sitting, I'll have 100 to 150 um, photographs from that from that session, and I will choose five or six and just pop them up here on the wall, and then I I um, I start to paint from that. That I essentially recreate the sitting in the studio, simply because no one's got, you know, four hours to sit around being painted. And of course I'd have to take this entire rig and I've got special daylight lighting in the background here, so I'd have to bring all that to to the sitting. So it's just, it's much, much simpler to uh, use the reference shots in the sitting first and then bring that here. Um, and I choose the reference shots. I mean, I generally work from five or six different shots which will amplify, there'll be, usually I like to have one that's the dominant pose, one that has got a, a good dominant uh, matching face, and then I usually have a few more detail, alternative detail shots, so I can see perhaps what the ear is like, or perhaps what the, the socket of the eye is like as a close-up, or um, how the light falls on the nose, or something like that. As long as I've got about five or six of those, I can sort of meld them in my head as I paint and they just kind of become one painting. A number of things. Movement in some cases. Um, 
sometimes that's movement of the mainly it's movement of the individual but sometimes I've tried to uh, get into the movement of the light and I've had with some paintings in particular as a cabinet minister a shadow cabinet minister that um, has kind of dancing light in front of her face and um, so sometimes it's about movement of light movement of, of the individual always of course as a portrait painter you've got to get a likeness so that's that's something that just has to be there it's not so much of an expression but you do want to try and put uh, something of that of the personality into that painting obviously um, and so whether it's a composed sort of look you want or a more active engaged look um, which I strongly believe suits politicians and I think many of them should adopt more of those kinds of poses for their their um, their own portraiture photography um, and sometimes I um, it's the light that I'm, I'm trying to um, the light and dark um, aspects that I'm trying to bring to the fore so that um, if someone's got a very sculptural face they're going to lend themselves a little bit to the expression of that um, before and after kind of uh, theme that we've got going for the show. Well, my, f my father was a, um, a Scottish painter um, given much to texture structure um, and uh, geometry and he used a lot of geometric shapes in in his abstract work um, and I suppose he's his love of texture and shape in particular are things that I've always held very dear um, I really do like texture and I use a lot of textures in my work whether they're um, canvases or whether they're they're overlaid textures created from the paint um, but I also use um, uh, not quite a geometric structure, but I use a, a geometric approach to lines to a certain extent. So I'm, sometimes I'm putting some of those guidelines in at the start just to map out where the um, head is going to go. And I quite often leave those lines in. I, I, I like to sort of see how the original um, sketch effectively took shape. But in, in creating those lines, I have brushes which vary in width and can behave in slightly geometric ways. So I, I, I use that. But I suppose, I mean, both my father and my mother, um, my father's dead now, but uh, uh, my mother still um, uh, works creatively. And, and she's been an artist all her life. And um, both having two parents as... as um, as creatives just sort of it lets you see as a child as you're growing up that you can make a, a living from being creative you know so digital art is what's produced from a computer um, and I suppose a lot of people are suspicious about computers because in the early days digital art really meant work generated by a computer not by a human user using the computer as a tool. Um, and actually, I don't see anything wrong with that kind of art at all. It's not, I don't do it, but um, uh, if that's what you want to do, that's cool. Um, but I think the critics of, of digital art um, tend to mix that early notion of uh, digital art with contemporary digital art. Which and of course, you know, contemporary digital art is every bit as skillful, um, challenging, enjoyable, stretching as conventional physical paints. Um, and just about all software these days behaves exactly the same as physical paints. So they that you have liquidity, you have bleed, you have gravity, you have wind. If you want to go as far as that, um, you have pitted surfaces to paint on and you can make your textures all behave in that kind of way so in fact really a computer is just a it's just a tool and um, it's what you do with it of course which is uh, which is the main thing um, so that's what I would say to people who don't get digital art or don't understand perhaps how like real art real physical conventional painting 
um, it has become. I suppose I hope this show produces two really big things. One is, obviously the works are for sale, and uh, we hope to raise a good block of money to go directly to medical research for Parkinson's. Um, but secondly, I hope that the, the sitters, all of whom have come forward and lent their faces to the show, um, I hope that these sitters and the videos that we've made of them, and especially the people with Parkinson's who've told their stories about what it's like living with Parkinson's, all together uh, can help to raise awareness about um, the condition, um, how it's possible to live with it, and how much hope there is now for new cures uh, emerging. Um, some people with Parkinson's wobble, some people with Parkinson's have rigid faces, some people have all sorts of different kinds of conditions. Um, most of us don't really know um, how to, to tell whether someone has Parkinson's or, or some similar ailment. But they're not mad and they're not, uh, you know, they're, they're not, they're not um, stricken people. They are normal people um, who are living with a, a pretty difficult condition. And so I hope the show will help to bring uh, some improved awareness um, of uh, what Parkinson's is. But on top of that, on a personal level, uh, I have two friends with Parkinson's. So I hope in some way this show will go towards helping them to improve the quality of their life.